Welcome to All Nations Church. We restore and release potential in people by connecting them to God. Welcome our senior pastor, Dr. Frank Ofosu Apia. Wow, what a wonderful time of praise and worship from Kerry's house. And again, good evening from our studios, Kerry's studios. And tonight, it's a pleasure and an honor for us to come your way to fellowship with you and more so to break the bread of life uh, together. You know, one of the most important things that uh, as a believer you must realize is that your growth must be non-negotiable, your growth as a Christian. And when I talk about growth, I'm not talking about just numerical growth or uh, chronological growth, but I'm talking about spiritual growth, growing in the things of God. You know, the, the apostle said, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So thank you so much for uh, being with us tonight in this evening's teaching service. It's going to be a wonderful time. We're going to talk about the contagious church. You know, uh, it's been advertised and uh, a whole lot of people are very interested in what this thing is all about. And uh, we're going to find out uh, in a little while. And so, um, if you don't mind, please, let's, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is the teacher and the preacher. Tonight we ask, Holy Spirit, work through me. Teach your people, teach the body, teach the church, teach the world. Let somebody's passion be reignited. Let somebody suddenly be, be filled with some holy passion to be a contagious Christian. We thank you. In the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ, amen and amen and amen and amen. Well, <clears throat> For uh, us as a church, um, the, the word that God gave to us this year is, uh, is, is from Genesis chapter 8, um, the backdrop of the flood of Noah, you know, and uh, the whole of humanity, the whole world was decimated by a flood. It was a judgment upon the earth and humanity was, was taken out except Noah and um, his wife and his three sons and their, three wa and their wives, which made it eight people. They survived. And in Genesis chapter 8, after the waters have been on the earth and all humanity, vegetation had been destroyed, the Bible says, then God remembered Noah. And when we talk about God remembering Noah, it is not in the sense that God has forgotten about them, but God comes at the right time um, to, to meet them so that his eternal purposes are made manifest. And in verse, verse number 11 of Genesis 8, it talks about the fact that Noah sent a dove. The dove went about flying about and came back with a fig leaf, uh, an olive leaf, I beg your pardon, in its mouth, telling Noah that the waters have begun to recede. They are receding. And on that backdrop, God gave us our word for 2021, which is the year of resurgence. A resurgence means a recovery, a renewal, a revival. Life is coming. We've been, we've been and we are still, we, we are still fighting it. Um, we are in a pandemic, a very virulent um, um, virus is, is ravaging humanity, um, killing, ravaging, pillaging, destroying, bringing economies to its knees. And, but, but if you look at this world and how God handles this world, no disaster is permanent, no trouble is permanent. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So we believe that this year, regardless of everything, the waters of the pandemic are beginning to recede and we are rising up again. You see, many times if you wait, until the perfect time, you wait too long and you wait too late. And so we are at the, at the, at the, at the, at the, we are at the top of the curve, you know, about what God is going to do. We are like the children of Issachar, the sons of Issachar, who have understanding of the times. And so we have foresight, we plan, we, we, get our, we position ourselves right for what God is about to do. And every month we have themes that we deal with. And this month in all our churches, the theme is, is a month of resurgence of the church. The resurgence of the church. And this is so dear to my heart because, um, especially during this pandemic, uh, the church of Jesus Christ has come under a lot of attack. Not that the church has not been attacked. I mean, from the day number one, when this thing was inaugurated on the day of Pentecost, the church has come under assault. No two ways about that. But during the, this pandemic especially, we realized that people's faith is flatlined. 
all kinds of things have been said about the church abuses, the insinuations, the assumptions. So we want to, we want to let people know that this thing called the church that Jesus said to the disciples that he was building and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against is still alive and it's still, still well. And so we are, we are going to do And we started last Sunday in, in dealing with it. And what we said uh, in, in mostly was that the church necessarily is not a what or a where. Because normally when we talk about church, people think a building, a landmark, or a place where we go for weddings or funerals or socialization or something of that nature. No. Um, the church is a who. It's a who. Whenever you see a building, it is a building that the church goes in there to be trained, uh, to get together, to learn, to, to be disciples, so they can go out into the world and be contagious people to affect people with influence. So the church, in effect, is what the Greek call ecclesia. Ecclesia. It means a called out people, people who are called out. It's a gathering of people. And on, on Sunday, we, we, we gave the backdrop uh, from Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus took his disciples to a place called Caesarea. Philippi and we played a little clip we, um, we were there a couple of years ago and then we visited Caesarea Philippi proper right at the base of Mount Hermon where they had the cave of Pan a mythical Greek god who who, who was vile who, who who brought a lot of idolatry and drew people in their bestiality prostitution orgies all kinds of evil that you can imagine and it was at that place that Jesus decided to bring his disciples and inaugurate his church and talk about the fact that he was bringing out something that has never been done before. He said, in this place, in this place of evil, in this place of terrible bestiality and all kinds of things happening, I'm going to build an entity called a church. I'm going to pull you out of all this and I'll use you to be the building blocks of something that will influence the world and the gates of hell shall never prevail against the church. And so tonight, we want to look at the contagious church. And I'm, we're going to read from 1 Thessalonians. So if you have your Bibles, please, and please make sure you make notes. 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter number 1. Uh, one of the things I encourage Christians to do, please, learn to go through the Bible uh, precept upon precept, book upon book, letter upon letter. Because right now, I realize that the generation we are in, people don't have a lot of time to study the Word of God together. They don't, they, we don't do systematic study of the Word of God. And so um, you, you need to do that. So today we are we are looking at um, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. There are 10 verses in there and we're going to read all the 10 verses. Uh, Paul is in a team, he and Silvanus and Timothy. And so this letter was written uh, from the apostle to the church at Thessalonica. And it says that uh, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. We give thanks to God always for you, making, well, I beg your pardon, verse number three, remembering without season your work of faith, labor of love, and the patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel, now I want you to note it carefully. He said, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, in and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Then he goes on to say, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in which, in, in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord, has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had, had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivered us from wrath to come. That is so powerful. That is so, 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 so powerful. You see, Jesus said to the disciples that I am pulling you out um, to become a people who influence the world. That is our mandate as a people of God. We are to influence. We are to be contagious people that wherever we go, we leave a mark there. And that influence, Jesus said, will happen through the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel. The gospel is good news. Now, I, 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 let, let me teach something a little bit. 
You see, there are some words that we find in the Bible that we have Christianized them. But something like the gospel in the Greek, evangelion, is not a church word. It's not a Bible word. It was a secular word. It was used for runners who brought good news. Sometimes the empire, like Rome, will go to war, or Greek, Greece will go to war. And when they had defeated the enemy, somebody has to run and take the good news back to the city to announce that victory has come. And Paul borrowed that word and brought it that, or sometimes even, let's say, a prince is born to a, a, a king or a queen, they have a herald who heralds the good news. Hear ye, hear ye. So and so, prince, so and so has been born. Princess, so and so has been born. Those people are the evangelists, the, the bearer of good news. And Paul used that. The Bible uses, or the, the gospel writers use that to denote the fact that we were under bondage, we were in darkness. We are sold out to sin. But Jesus came and died and rose again and broke the power of the enemy. And so that is the good news. The defeat of everything that has held you and I up back. Sin has been defeated. Bondage, fear, that all the things that, that break us down, that make us less than what God has ordained it to be, is broken because of the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, in order for you and I to be influencers, to influence the world, there must be some contact of some sorts. Now, we are all covenant, unless you are living under a rock. We all know that we are in the middle of a, a, a pandemic, a coronavirus pandemic. And hopefully we are all taking precautions. As I look around the studio, everybody is taking precautions. People are in masks. We are practicing social distancing. We are not getting into very large crowds, even though we miss our crowds. Um, the reason why we are, we, are, we are taking all these protocols and precautions is because we know we have seen it with our eyes. We have experienced some that this virus is contagious. How does the virus travel? Three major ways. Number one, social contact. That is why we have social distancing. That's why we don't get into too many crowds. Social contact. It also spreads through touch. And it also spreads through speaking. When other people, when people are, are infected, they can speak and the droplets that carry the virus can infect you. They can touch you and you can be affected. In the social context, you can be affected. So the same way that this virus travels is the same way that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ must and should travel. I wonder what will happen in our world today, in our world today, if all of us, you and me, we became gospel contagious for Jesus. That through our touch, through social contact, through our speaking, can make people infected, not with a wrong virus, but with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please hear me. You will agree with me that influence is very powerful. And influence is contagious. And influence can be both negative or positive. Let me give an example. Let's say in your home your children are perfect. You know everybody's children are perfect. And then they go to school and one day the principal, the headmaster calls and says, your son, your daughter has been misbehaving, getting into all kinds of trouble. Normally the first thought that comes into your head is, who has been influencing my child? Somebody is influencing them. In the Garden of Eden, in a state of perfection, in the state of sinless perfection, something happened. And when God came in and asked his, his people, Adam and Eve, where are you? And they began to talk. The first thing God said is that, who told you you were naked? They have been infected. Somebody, a contagious individual has infected them. And I have realized that history is not changed by authority or brute force. History is changed by influence. People who changed history were people who had influence. All of us have been influenced by people. And that is why we are the way we are. If you look into your heart, if you look into your life, you'll agree with me that one person can come into your life, that is social contact, and can so influence you sometimes by their touch, by their words, that your thinking, your speaking, your worldview, your behavior, your habits are all affected. This is the contagion I'm talking about. Influence as a Christian. And you can be influenced or you can be infected by the virus called fear. Or you can be infected 
by faith. It depends on the person that you are in contact with. You realize that there are some people that any time you come in contact with, no matter how high your faith is, somehow the faith is depleted and it's substituted by fear. There are people, anything that they send you on social media, they forward, is gory, is full of bad news, everything. It is influence. You can be influenced by love or you can be infected by hate. You can be infected by negativity or you can be infected by positivity. Let's take two scriptures, one from the New Testament and one from the Old Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 33, the Apostle Paul said, do not be deceived. Don't deceive yourself. Don't let somebody deceive you. Because you, you think you can, you, you, uh, let's, let's finish. It says, evil company corrupt good habits. Which means if you think that you're going to be in the wrong company and come out okay, you are self-deceived. Of all forms of deception, the worst is self-deception. Because of all people who are deceived, they're self-deceived at the last to know that they are deceived. You cannot lie down with dogs and expect not to get, get up with fleas. It's as simple as that. So if you constantly hang out in a wrong crowd, no matter how good you are, you will be contaminated. It's as simple as that. You realize that if you wear white clothing and you go into a place where it's, let's say there's cold, there's darkness, your white clothing will never make that thing, that, that thing. It, it will contaminate you. Proverbs chapter 13, one of my favorite scriptures, Proverbs 13 and 20. It says that the one who walks with the wise will be wise. Please know that. Maybe, uh, may, may I give you about three seconds to think about this and begin to reorder some places that you go to. The one, if you walk with, he who walks with wise people will be wise. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. Which means you don't need Satan to be destroyed. All you need is to be among fools. And you're going to be in trouble. And so I believe that Christians... We must be some of the most contagious people on earth. So contagious that if somebody gets near you and me, there should be enough high potency life in us that should affect people one way or the other. When people get amongst us, whether it's at work, at home, wherever we go, we must be so contagious that people know that there's something different about us. In fact, even if a mosquito bites you, the mosquito must go flying, singing, there's power in the blood. That is the power. That is how contagious you and I must be with the power of God on the inside of us. Is that what we see today? Sadly, the enemy through fear and through brainwashing and working on our minds, through media, through social media, television, whatever, has almost, you know, I'm using pandemic words, has almost quarantined many Christians. And we have our own language. Oh, witnessing is dangerous. You can't even share the gospel. You must maintain. But I realized some few months ago, living in America here, that there was a high stake election coming up. And you wouldn't believe how many times people knocked on our door soliciting for our votes for particular candidates. Now, if people are not afraid to sell something, to knock on doors, to be aggressive, to, so that you can, they can influence you to vote for their candidate, what stops you and I from being aggressive and passionate enough to influence people to make a decision for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Think about that. We have been quarantined. And with, with that, the message, the good news, the gospel has been reduced to less than what it should be. Yes, I agree. Coronavirus is very contagious. But we... Christians, you and I, with the gospel of the Lord Jesus and the message should be even more contagious in this world. People, it's time for us to lift ourselves up from the, 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 the time and the mentality of we are going to church, we are going to a particular place because of what is in it for me. I believe that it is time for us to, to remove the clothing of selfishness. Let me tell you something. God takes care of his own. I have done this thing long enough. I have followed Jesus long enough that nobody would be able to convince me that God doesn't take care of his own. Listen, one time Jesus, I think it's in Matthew 10 and Matthew 11, if you read it, Jesus sent his disciples to go and preach in all the cities and villages. And you realize that the Bible says that they left and they went. 
and so beautiful. The Bible says that after they left and they went, Jesus went into their villages. You see, once they vacated their villages and they went preaching, Jesus went to where they had vacated and then he did miracles for them. Anytime you give yourself to do something, to, to take the gospel, to, to witness, to talk to people, to do good, to care for people, God takes care of you. He says that, listen, there's the law of sowing and reaping. It's the principle. It's an eternal principle. Whatever you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. I believe that it is time for us as a church, with all that has happened, we need to really sit back and look at ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, are all the Christian fights worth it? All the fussing, all the, the, the hatred, all the splits, are they worth it? I believe that it is time for us to be contagious with love for one another. Love people unconditionally, regardless of denomination, color of their eyes, color of their skin, their accent, wherever they are coming from. Under the cross of Jesus Christ, the ground is level. We must love one another. We must go out of our own selfishness to care for people, including those who disagree with us. We must be willing to forgive. We must be willing to love. Please hear me. Don't give up. On this world God put us here for a reason and for a purpose I was telling a group of leaders the other day that God in his spirit if we believe which I know we do that God is omniscient which means he knows the end of a thing even before the thing begins as for the middle is a cakewalk for him and he knows that in the year 2020 there will be a pandemic 2021 will still be battling it and so if God is knows that then the fact that he has raised you and I as leaders during this time means that he believes in you. So don't give up on your world, church. Don't give up on your world. There's hope in Jesus Christ. Be a contagious witness who will stand up for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we, 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 we've, we've just read from 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. And let me give you a little background. Now, Thessalonica... Thessalonica, where the, 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 the letter the Thessalonians were told, is in present day Greece, where we have Greece in Europe. And in those days, when, the, when Paul was writing, Greece was divided into two regions. So you see that Paul talked about Macedonia and Achaia. The northern region was Macedonia, and the south was Achaia. That is what it was. And that area was like modern day New York City. A smuggler's board, a melting pot of all kinds of people. They were drawn there because of commerce. They were drawn there because of, of politics. They were drawn there because of um, all the things, economy, everything that was happening. So we had the Germanic people. We had the Gauls. We had people from, from the British Isles. We had the Vikings from the north who came in. They all migrated there. There were also Greek Greek local, uh, I mean local Greeks. They were in there who had come from Athens. And then, of course, all these people coming together, they had philosophers, they had Stoics, they had, okay, and of course, Jews also were there who constituted 40% of the population. Now, think about a place like that. It was full of idolatry because we're going to look at it. Paul talked about that. Full of idolatry. There was superstition, all kinds of theories, conspiracy theories, like in America today. And it was into such an environment that Paul says that the gospel of Jesus Christ went. Now, let me challenge you a little bit, child of God. Please hear me. Many times we complain about the environment that God has sent us into. We go into a work situation. I've had people come to me, Pastor, I don't like my work situation at all. There are no Christians there. And I said, why did God make you a light in darkness? Why did you land that job? Listen, maybe you think you got that job and you testified to the fact that you got the job even though you were not qualified. Could it be that heaven had an agenda for putting you in there? That you'll be salt and that you'll be light in that environment. In the corporate office, in the warehouse, driving the taxi, the Uber, in your neighborhood, even in your family. Could it be that God placed you in that environment for a reason and for a purpose? That you have been raised up for such a time as this. Please hear me. Wherever you find yourself, God in his predetermined counsel, put you there for a reason and for a purpose. <coughs> I beg your pardon. And that reason is to be a contagious Christian. You are salt and you are light. Salt and light. 
they make an effect wherever they go. Whenever there is darkness and light appears, no matter darkness's protestations, darkness has to run. My question is, in which dark places have you gone to that your light has brought illumination to people? In what corrupt places have you gone to that your salt, you being salt, has brought some incorruption? According to historical accounts, Paul the Apostle spent only three weeks, only three weeks in that city, Thessalonica, only three weeks in a city that had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ before. They had philosophers, they had all kinds of gods, everything in there, debauchery. I mean, you, you talk about a, 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 an old in time New York, everything is there. And Paul gets into the city and in three weeks, Three weeks, Paul was in the city for three weeks before he walks away. And within those three weeks, a church has been planted. And the church survives persecution, survives pressure, assaults, and everything. And you wonder how today, today, there are Christians who because of a virus have quit their faith. When I read the statistics, my heart breaks that because of a virus, between March of last year and September, six months, about 30% of Christians were not going to church anymore. I'm not talking about even online. They don't go to church. And today, the number is even heartbreaking that there are people who have said they will not return to a Christian gathering or to fellowship anymore because of a virus. So what is your foundation? Is it possible that this is what Paul the Apostle was writing about in 2 Timothy chapter number 3? And verse number 1 about the traits of the end time that know this that in the last days dangerous times perilous times shall come and Paul gives us about 18 19 20 traits of the end times and here are some of them he said people will be lovers of themselves oh is there is there a generation that loves ourselves that is why the most the, the most the, 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 the most numerous photos that are taken are selfies we love ourselves we we'll go on Facebook and we look at our photos and we go to see how many people have liked it. We wake up in the night just to check how many likes that we have had. And we are so happy and we make sure we reply to every one of them because we love ourselves. People shall be lovers so we don't want to die for anything. Oh, from my home to church is five minutes. Oh, they block the road so there's a detour for three, 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 one mile or one. Oh, I can't. Lovers of themselves. And then another thing is this, that we are lovers of pleasure rather than the lovers of God. Why even need to go in there? Lovers of pleasure. People will live for a Friday night. Even in the COVID season, people are still going to basements to, to have parties and things. And you are wondering, where are the Christians of our God? Who would die for this? For they overcame them, him by the blood of the Lamb. By the word of their testimony. That is where most of us end. But he finishes by saying, and they love not their lives unto death. He says that such people, they have a form, a form of godliness that denies the power of God. If there's such a powerless generation today that I have seen, I can dare say that it is today's generation because we love ourselves. So when we talk about fasting, the first question is, when are we breaking? When we talk about prayer, what are the prayer points so I can pray in my bed? Listen, it is time for you and I to be contagious Christians. We need to return to the ancient landmarks. And in the scripture that we, we just read in 1 Thessalonians, Paul in effect is saying, I brought the gospel to you. I announced Jesus to you, even though you had no idea who this Jesus was. Yet you believe it. You know how that is how Paul started the, the, the letter to the Thessalonians. That I brought, I brought the word of God to you. You didn't know Jesus. You may have heard from some rumors that this man was crucified by the Romans somewhere in, in, in Jerusalem or something. And you may have heard uh, an incredible rumor that oh, that guy rose up after, after, after three days and his disciples were going on. But listen, he said, I spoke that gospel to you and you believe the message. And by believing it, the whole city is infected and the whole city is turned upside down. My heart desire, ladies and gentlemen, is that we will be a Christian, a Christ, you and I will be a Christian that Jesus can rely on to turn places upside down with his power. In Acts chapter 17, 
and verse number six. The disciples went preaching. The Bible says that they, they dragged those where there was a whole up, uproar somewhere. And it says that these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Those who have turned the world upside down. Maybe they should have rewritten it. If I had the opportunity, I would have done that. That those who have turned the world right side up have come here too. This is not referring to an army. It's not referring to people with degrees. It's not talking about theologians or philosophers. No. They were referring to some group of fishermen. Carpenters. Tax collectors. Dubious people. Terrorists who have been converted and they are following the Messiah and they are witnessing the power of the Messiah everywhere and nothing could stop them because they believed everything in their bones knew and believed that Jesus is the Messiah and he has the answer to most all the problems of this world. Please hear me. Why have we made Jesus just an add-on? Why have we just made the church, the called out people, just a gathering? No. He called us to be a contagious people. He called us to affect the world. And so in, the, in this last few minutes, let's look at some three things that Paul said about the Thessalonians. And let's learn about this contagion. Today we are doing contagious disease called the gospel. Number one, in verse number seven, if we can look at verse number seven of 1 Thessalonians chapter number one, Paul says something, he said, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe you became. So number one, he said, you are a contagious example. He said you became an example. When you got born again, you became an example. That word example is the Greek word tupos. T-U-P-O-S is tupos. Is the Greek word tupos. And, and the idea is something that has been formed by an impression, a mark. For example, you, they use signet rings to make an impression in hot wax. You know, you can take potty and, 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 or play-doh and play with it and make a mark. And he said, you people left a mark wherever you went. So my question tonight as we study together, and I hope we are doing okay, is that what do you think will happen if we made such a mark, such an impression, that when people see us coming, they will say, here comes hope. Here comes good news. Here comes love. Let me tell you something, church. People are watching you. People see you before they hear you. In fact, our actions are louder impressions than our words. So today, can we begin to be contagious, but contagious with hope, contagious with kindness? Can we be known in our neighborhood, in our community, in, in our corporate offices, wherever we go to work, that we are contagious with charity? We have empathy. So much that wherever we go, we leave a mark, an example. Listen, it is not hard, and I say this with a lot of conviction, it is not hard to leave a kind impression in life as a child of God. Just a word of encouragement. There are people that you work with. They have problems. They have things that on their heads. Why haven't you opened your mouth? Not to condemn them, but to make an impression. Listen, people may not remember what you said to them, but they will hardly forget how you made them feel. The Apostle Paul said, you are an example, a contagious example. Then the next thing in verse number nine, we look at verse number nine. It says, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned from God to idols to serve the living God, which means they had a contagious message. They had a contagious message. Actually, let me, let me go to verse number 8. I, I, I don't know if we can do that on our thing, but he talks about the fact that for from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. From you the word of the Lord 
has sounded forth. From you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Look at that. The word of, from you. Now, it's very important from you, the word of God has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone out. So here you see that Paul is saying that the message that I brought to you, that you took, you have used it to impact the whole city and the surrounding areas. And he said by you, which means Paul says that this revival, this gospel message that is infecting all kinds of people was not by me, the apostle. It was not by me any great apostle, but, but from you. So could it be possible that, listen, the college campuses that our young ones, generation next, you are, you are there. Our corporate offices, the chance meetings, the grocery stores, the places that you go to. Could it be that you, not a great apostle, not your pastor, not Billy Graham, not some great evangelist, is the one who is going to infect them, but it is you. The gospel of Jesus must be shared with people. Please let me say this. The gospel is not a doctrine to be studied. It is an announcement to be made. And you say, what announcement? That look at me. I used to be this. But look at what this. Listen, all your self-help classes, all your counseling classes, all can never, ever, ever, ever get you to that place that the gospel of Jesus Christ can get you to. Here's the story of a man in Mark chapter 5. He's a maniac. He's crazy. He's filled with about 6,000 demons. He's living in rocks. He's cutting himself. He breaks chains with supernatural demonic power. And this man encounters Jesus. And Jesus sets this man free from all the demonic oppression and all the trouble. The man is so excited, just like you and I. And he said, listen, Lord, I want to follow you everywhere. It's like us. Ah, now we just want to go and dance in church. But in Mark chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus says something. He said, Jesus did not permit this man to follow him, but he said, go home. Jesus is telling somebody today, go home, go home, go home to your friends, go to your people and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Tell them that I used to be this, but this is who I am today. You don't need to debate. You don't need to, to have a voluminous vocabulary. You don't have to have all the knowledge of theology from all theological books. Because an example, when you are a, a person with an experience, is never at the mercy of a person with an argument. When they know you that you used to be this, but now you are this, you are able to be a contagious Christian. Maybe I suspect that the reason you, are, you can't be is because they don't see any difference in you. Romans 10 and 14. The Apostle Paul was talking about sharing the gospel. And he said, how shall they call on whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It was not talking about people with Bibles and suits who have come out of Bible school, but you and I. Please hear me. Say something to somebody. Be a contagious Christian. Like I said, don't get into arguments. Because the world sometimes wants to argue and put you in a corner so they can justify themselves. Don't get into debates. You may lose. Just say what heaven is saying. And you are saying, teacher, what is heaven saying to a dying world? Heaven is saying to a dying world that I still love you unconditionally. That you don't have to die in your sin. That this thing doesn't have to destroy you. Heaven is saying to this world through your mouth that hope is not lost where Jesus is concerned. Heaven is saying that no matter how dastardly your sins are, he will still forgive. The blood still forgives. He will see you through. I'm, my life was like that. There was no hope. When the enemy told me to sin one, I sinned ten. And yet, somebody cared about me enough to be persistent and passionate to share the gospel with me. I have a, a little plea. Please, can you for once quote what heaven is saying more? than the way you quote your favorite preacher or celebrity. They had a contagious message. And finally, in verse number 9, he said, you have a contagious impact. He said, for they themselves declare concerning what manner of entry we had to you, how you have turned to God from idols to serve the living God. They themselves declared that because of the message that Paul brought, they have turned from idols to the living God. They are now serving the living God. Maybe you may not know, but just one person on this Bible study today on this platform 
You may never know, but you have the capacity to infect and influence people. That when you do that, wherever you go to gather as a church, will not be able to contain the people. I kid you not. We don't need all the thousands and millions of dollars to go into some far-flung foreign countries to go and hold crusades and, and let the heathen raise their hands and we take photographs and come and print them in magazines. No. One person can make a difference. Jesus meets a woman in John chapter 4 by the well of Sychar, Jacob's well. A notorious woman. Had no rep good reputation. But Jesus engages the woman with love. But in the end, in verse 28, the Bible says that the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the man, I have met a man. I'm sure they would have said, but you're always meeting men. She said, no, this one is different. And the Bible says that she brought the whole city to Jesus. One woman, this is pure contag contagion. She infected the whole city with her testimony that I have met, this one is different. I look into his eyes and it's not lustful like other men have looked into my eyes. Look around you. Do you see any need? And I bet you do. That is your call. In 1993, my wife and I, mommy and I were in a, a full gospel uh, convention in Baltimore, Maryland. And one of the speakers made such an indelible impact on me that this thing has never left me. You may not have heard of him because he's not your normal celebrity. But I believe that the day this man enters into heaven, Angels and saints will salute his welcome. And I'm talking about a man called Bill Winston. Very unassuming man. He, has, he, he said his story right there that he has been to churches to speak and he had been disrespected because of the way he entered. People never thought that was the Bill Winston because normally they, th they, they, think, they, they think he's going to be like this huge guy, imposing guy. But here's a man whose face is disfigured because he's been shot so many times. He's been beaten with baseball bats. He's, been, he's, been, he's gone through a whole lot of things because his ministry is based in Brooklyn, in New York. Children, he has the largest children's Sunday school in the world. Every weekend, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of children come. But how did it happen? His single mother was raising him. And one day all he heard mother say was that, I can't take this anymore. I'm tired. And the mom took him and they got to a little covert in the street over a bridge and said, Bill, wait here. I'll be back. The little boy stood there for a day. The next, mommy never came back. A, a man had seen him standing there as a young boy, not even a teenager. And the man took him in and paid a few dollars to send Bill Wilson to vacation Bible school in Florida. He talked about half of the things that were said. He couldn't even get it. But he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And out of this, he holds the biggest children's church in the whole world. Every Saturday, thousands of children are buzzed. Where people are running away from the neighborhoods, he is running into it. He's a contagious believer for Jesus. His book, Whose Child Is This? is a bestseller. I recommend it to you. You know why I'm passionate about this? I'm really passionate tonight, church, because in reality, there are no unimportant people in this world. Please hear me. Sometimes, uh, when we're planting our church, a lot of people, few people that I meet, they tell me, who is your target group? And I consider it an insult. Since when did we turn being a contagious Christian to become demographics and who are we trying to reach? We are trying to reach white collar people. We are trying to reach blacks. We are trying to reach, how? What, is that what Jesus handed over to us? There's no unimportant. If somebody had not reached out to Bill Wilson, these thousands of children, some come to the Sunday school, they go back and they are caught in the crossfire of drug, drug barons, they are, they are shooting and they go to heaven. What if? Please hear me. In Revelation chapter 3, and we're not going to read everything, but from verse 14 to 19, Jesus, talking to the seven churches, zeroed in on the church of Laodicea. And he said, let, let, let's go on. He says, faithful and things, go to the next verse. And he, begins, he says, I know your works. You are lukewarm. You are lukewarm. You've lost it. It's just like today's church. 
We have passion for things that don't have eternal value. And we have lost sight of divine moments. Please, do you know what you are capable of? You are a contagious person. There's influence on you. Nobody knows who that person you are influenced for you are influencing for Jesus would be. People's eternal destiny rests on your influence. May, may you have some sleepless nights thinking about that because we have lost the essence of Jesus saying that I'm building my church. He built you and I, he pulled us out. Ecclesia to go and affect the world. You are you are you are he says you are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, God's only people to show forth his praises. Everybody that you work with, everybody that you pass by has an eternity. And maybe you are the bridge between them and that eternity. Will you awake to the fact that he called you to be a contagious Christian, to impact other people's lives? Will you be like Sister Sophia, who saw me and my two friends People with potential, but never discovered it, wasting our lives away and determined that I'm going to fast and pray and talk to these young guys until they come to know Jesus. She put so much pressure on me that to get her off my back, I followed her to church by mistake. And that day, for the first time in my life, I heard the claims of the gospel. Scales fell from my eyes. I saw my lostness. And I gave my life to the Lord. The rest is not history. The rest is something that you are seeing right now. Will you pray until a particular individual comes to Jesus Christ? Will you love that unlovable person, but with an agenda that I want to infect the person with the love of Jesus Christ? Or do you give up easily? Do you just fellowship with people who even are in your... Today, Christians don't even fellowship with people who are not in their denomination. Where did, how low can we get? And so tonight, wherever you are, don't, don't turn off your, your, your machine. I hope you are being convicted. There's a charge to keep that we have. Our God to glorify. And never dying soul to save. And fit it for the sky. To set this present age, our calling to fulfill. And oh, my powers, Lord, engage. To do my master's will. Are you going to pray that, Lord, I me with jealous care, that in only thy side rely, and all thy servant, Lord, prepare a strict account to give. You want to tell him, listen, for years, you've never told anybody your testimony. You've never shared. Can you make it a determination that in 2021, you will touch only one, not two, not ten. If any uh, uh, over one is, is a plus, can you touch just one person and bring them into the fold, into the gathering, into the ecclesia, bring them into Jesus? We have work to do. Church is not for style show. Meeting together is not for style. It's for what I'm teaching today. Father, I pray. Make us Awake, awaken us again to our first love, where our hearts beat for souls, that our concern is for the lost, that we will be people who rescue the perishing and care for the dying, snatch them with pity from sin and the grave. Father, cause us to weep over the erring one and lift up the fallen and tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Break our hearts, O God. Heal us from our sinful pride. Deliver us from self. Lord, place before us the assignment again that we have been saved to save others. We thank you. In the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our website at allnationsusa.com or simply call the church office at 770-923-8383. Subscribe to our YouTube page. Like us on Facebook. And follow us on Twitter. Stay blessed.